Hi, this is Dr. Diane Gayhart, and this is my lecture on dialectic behavioral therapy uh, to accompany my text, uh, Theory and Treatment Planning and Counseling and Psychotherapy, the second edition. You can uh, get a single e-chapter um, if you would like also uh, that includes uh, the treatment plan templates and case conceptualization templates for uh, DBT. And there are also a lot more free resources at masteringcompetencies.com. So let's begin with, in a nutshell, the least you need to know. So DBT is an evidence-based treatment. In many ways, it's one of the first or most, uh, I think, widely recognized uh, evidence-based treatment. And it was originally developed for persons diagnosed with borderline personality disorder by uh, Marsha Linehan, who has been the primary developer of the theory uh, since the 1980s. Uh, borderline personality disorder uh, first was added to the in 1980 to the DSM and um, she began her research. It's a very difficult to treat populations and this approach certainly is used widely now um, with other disorders such as bipolar, even depression could benefit um, from DBT. So you will see it widely used. It is an approach, it's, it is an approach that includes um, and in its kind of conceptualized form, I'm sure these ideas can be used outside of the, the structured form, but in the, the formal structure way of doing DBT requires a year commitment to um, a skills group, and that would be weekly in addition to weekly individual psychotherapy uh, sessions. And so that, and we'll talk more about that, but it is a the, the treatment as conceptualized has both individual sessions and uh, weekly um, skill group sessions that clients must attend and they go together and they they complement each other. So the skills are often learned in the skills group and then in the session they're applying it to the client's life. And this was done, um, Linehan ended up doing this and requiring it of clients because as you probably know if you're listening to this, that people diagnosed with borderline personality tend to have a lot of life crisis. And so they never even got around to helping them develop coping skills because they were just putting out fires from week to week. And that is why the group component was required where they're not dealing with weekly crises, they're learning how, you know, uh, very many, um, well, they're adapted, they're dialectic cognitive behavioral skills is what they're learning in that group. So that's what that looks like. And so there is a very structured approach to teaching coping skills. And um, it includes some basic core mindfulness skills we'll go over. I um, mean, again, this is one of the first mindful informed therapies. Uh, mindfulness-based therapies are those that teach mindfulness in a group setting, but mindful informed therapies are therapies that use uh, the concepts of mindfulness um, and, and to, you know, in, in a more educational way or an applied way, and that's definitely, I would say, DBT is probably the first. Um, the, then there's skills on interpersonal effectiveness, emotional regulation, and distress tolerance. So these are the different sets of skills. I guess I should also mention, um, there are two books that you should buy if you're interested in this approach. One is her basic t book, the text for it. And then there is a treatment manual, which is actually an amazing find. It is the guidebook for running the group, and it is readily available on Amazon for not that much money. Um, and it has even down to the handouts for the clients. Are in the, so that's really wonderful um, that it is readily available um, to those wanting to use it. It is certainly out there. Of course, getting formal training before you, you know, is highly encouraged, but the materials are readily available. The Jews, significant contributions to the field. So when Linehan started working with persons diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, she began using standard cognitive behavioral therapy techniques. And she discovered they don't work so well. And, and so what she did is she integrated uh, concepts from family systemic therapies as well as in Buddhism. And with family therapy and Zen Buddhism, um, these theories are, are not linear. They are more, uh, they look at interactive patterns and they address, um, and what she, the, what she identified out of these is this dialectical tension that exists in most of life in terms of, and, and the classic dialectic is, you know, a thesis, antithesis, and a synthesis. And so, I love you, 
I can't stand what you're doing right now and how do I integrate that into a coherent version of who you are and how I'm going to respond to you and relate to you. So, and that we're constantly doing this and the, you know, it's an ongoing evolving process. And, um, so this is kind of what was unique about what she's adding to make CBT relevant to DBT, uh, to uh, those diagnosed with borderline. And so what Linehan was noticing is that those diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, there was this failure to effectively resolve many of the basic dialectic tensions that characterize the human mind, that characterize relationship and life. And, and so they would get into uh, this thinking that's all black and white thinking, the splitting. It's all everything, something's all good or all bad. I love you, you know, you're the best, you're perfect, and no, I hate you, you're a demon. And there's this back and forth, and they just could not reconcile um, these various um, polarities that characterize life. And so... Um, the, she fo she noticed that's where she brought in this concept of we need to help these um, help these people learn how to integrate some of these fundamental tensions in life these paradoxes and to look and to help kind of reconnect some of these so they have a much more holistic way of looking at things um, whether it's you know on the emotional level or relational level so this is a lot of the underpinnings of the theory. And of course, um, I highly recommend you read the first few chapters in her text that really go into describing how she developed this and and the theory of dialectics that, dialectics that underpins the whole model. And in this way, this is what she's adding to CBT uh, to make it relevant to this and effective with this population. So, so now I want to move on to talking about the big picture. Um, and an overview of the therapy process, which is quite a lengthy and involved process. So, in the beginning of DBT, there is a, a relatively involved pre-treatment stage of um, obtaining consent, and we'll go into more detail um, on this, but basically, when used in its formal way, the concepts can be used, you know, out of its formal um, manualized form, but there is a lengthy um, agreement that the client signs about that they will attend the weekly sessions, they will attend the um, group sessions, they will refrain from you know suicidal and self-harming behaviors, etc. There's also one that the therapist signs in terms of how their commitment to the client. And so this is the pre-treatment phase before anything can really begin. And that can actually be a fairly difficult thing to do with certain clients. Then in stage one, what you're doing here is reducing the crisis behaviors and increasing coping skills. So obviously addressing suicidal and self-harm behaviors, which is no small issue often with this population if you're working with persons diagnosed with um, borderline. Uh, um, addressing disruptive behaviors to the counseling process. Uh, and so ways that, you know, they are making it impossible for the treatment to be effective or move forward. Um, I, I addressing uh, behaviors and, um, and interfere with quality of life, which may include things like substance abuse or um, failing to show up to work or whatever that might be. And then increasing their coping skills, which is in large measure the focus of the uh, group sessions, is developing a very concrete, highly defined set of skills that have worksheets and, um, and it's highly manualized. A very concrete uh, set of coping skills are taught. So this provides the foundation for stage two, which is where then they go in and reduce trauma-related symptoms. This is actually very similar to trauma-focused CBT for children uh, in that you teach the coping skills first and then you can move on to the trauma. Um, the vast majority, I have seen numbers is into the 90s percent of persons diagnosed with borderline personality um, have trauma histories. I often, I'm kind of surprised that this didn't get renamed and put into the new trauma chapter in the DSM-5 since it's so highly correlated with uh, traumatic events in childhood, specifically and most frequently sexual abuse. So that, so stage one is stabilizing crises, getting coping skills so that they can go back and resolve trauma issues. 
Again, a very specific set of uh, techniques for that. And then the stage three is um, life inc uh, in increasing the life enhancing behaviors. So self-respects, learning self-validation rather than other valid wanting at validation from others and helping them to achieve their personal life goals. And so it is a treatment that uh, takes at least a year typically, um, if not and typically more than that, um, but it is found to be one of the most effective treatments for working with this very, very difficult to treat population. In fact, I have known many clinicians in my career who would say it's not treatable. And, and so I um, commend uh, Linehan on her work in figuring out, uh, learning how to work successfully with this population. Now, because typically uh, DBT is uh, used with high crisis clients, there are multiple modes of uh, intervention. One, as I mentioned, is weekly individual counseling sessions as well as a, a group skills training, uh, at least for the first year. And that is a highly structured group that is required, um, and as is the weekly individual. So those two, those three hours a week are basically required in the formal um, application of the model. In addition, uh, the therapist uh, makes his or herself available uh, via telephone consultation um, between sessions to help manage crises. And uh, it's also considered a formal part of the treatment that uh, case consultation for the counselors or therapists themselves is an important part of the model. It's a, it's a population that uh, is known for burning out therapists and counselors, and so she she built this into the a formal element of the approach is to have regular consultations to support the therapists and counselors in working with um, often some very challenging clients. And then finally, the ancillary, ancillary treatments may be added such as medication, substance abuse treatment, they would typically be referred out for that. Um, hospitalization or day treatment may also be used, um, whatever is necessary to help stabilize the client. So next, I'm going to talk a little bit about the therapeutic relationship in DBT, which is, which is quite involved and complex. Um, if you haven't worked with a person diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, um, you may have heard about it, that they are, they're famous for being challenging in many, many ways. And so Linehan, the, 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 and a successful therapeutic counseling relationship um, is it requires multiple levels, I think, for the therapist to function because there is a need for nurturance and support um, along with being able to challenge. And this is a very, um, uh, and, and Linehan conceptualizes this in a series of dialectics. The first is the dialectic of acceptance and change. And so this is and characterizes the therapeutic relationship in terms of accepting where the client is and also knowing that they're going to change. And um, coming out of that Zen Buddhist foundation, the way in Buddhism uh, change is promoted often or is conceptualized by accepting what is. You shift your relationship to it rather than struggling against it. You accept what is and through that the relationship sh shifts and then there is change. There is new possibility. And so this is part of the characteristic, too, of how the therapist is engaging the client, accepting what is, also knowing that it, through that change will happen, and also knowing that change is typically necessary to help them alleviate the suffering in their lives. And um, there's also this dialectic tension of unwavering centeredness at, balanced with compassionate flexibility. And this is a really tough one when working with this population. And so there's certain boundaries about, you know, the commitment is to come here into group on a regular basis. The commitment is be respectful. The commitment is this, while also being compassionately flexible, you know, in terms of being there um, for the between session crises, uh, being flexible where possible, um, and, and having to balance these two dialectics. And this is challenging with this population. It's a very so there's this unwavering centeredness and consistency along with being compassionately flexible in ways that don't compromise the integrity of the, of the therapy relationship and, and of the progress and of the work.
There's also this dialectic tension of being very nurturing, creating safety. I mean, typically these are highly traumatized individuals. So nurturing is really, really important while also being um, what they call benevolent, benevolently demanding. And so you're nurturing and yet you are going to be very kindly and gently demand that the um, client, um, you know, fulfill the... Um, terms of the contract, you know, in terms of coming to sessions, um, trying to use the skills that they have learned, to learn how to become more independent, to validate themselves. And so you're still challenging them to see things differently, to, to use their skills, to make changes while creating a lot of nurturance. And again, a very diff difficult dialectic of trying to balance these two um, elements. So there are client written client agreements in that pre-treatment stage that outline a one-year commitment to both individual and group sessions. Um, that outlines the circumstances for you know unilateral termination, like when the therapist you know how how this um, agreement might be terminated. Uh, outlines the expectations around attendance and what to do you know um, in terms of of attendance when one cannot make it for, uh, and how that will be handled for almost in some ways excused and unexcused absences. Um, looking at, uh, there's a commitment to, um, to stop suicidal and self-harming behaviors using the techniques that are offered. Um, there's a commitment to stop inter behaviors that would interfere with therapy itself. And again, that commitment to the skills group. There's also a practitioner agreement, and this is a lovely, again, counterbalance on um, that the client is agreeing to do all of these things. And they're also, and I think this is very respectful of the clients, who often don't receive a lot of respect in our field historically, that the practitioner makes an agreement with the clients. That they're going to make, and the phrase is, every reasonable effort. I will do every take every reasonable effort to provide competent care, whatever that means. So I'm not going to crazy lengths to prove that you, you know, like the client, um, but you will take every reasonable effort and you, you know, outline what that means. And the, you know, the practitioner agrees to be ethical, to be respectful, to maintain confidentiality. And the agreement also outlines that there will be consultation with other therapists about the case. And so, and obviously more details, um, but there is this very formal way of, um, starting uh, and outlining the agreement between setting very, very clear written boundaries. And this may, you know, take a couple of sessions to outline all of this and, and how it's going to work. But this commitment is um, required before the treatment really um, begins. So now we're going to talk about case conceptualization in DBT. So um, there are some basic foundational assumptions that uh, DBT therapists have even prior to um, the conceptualization part. And I think it's important to highlight because within the field of psychotherapy and counseling, um, there is a lot of negativity or negative stereotypes and negative, I would say, myths that clinicians have had about um, di a persons diagnosed with um, borderline personality and how to work with them. And many of these assumptions go counter to the popular um, you know, attitudes of practitioners because it has, you know, it's a difficult, it can be a very, very difficult population to work with. So the first assumption is that clients are doing the best they can. And so clients, this kind of has humanistic foundations out of Carl Rogers, but it's like they're doing the best they can. They may be cutting, they may be creating a lot of drama, they may be demanding, um, they may seem manipulative, but they're just doing the best they can to cope. And that's the basic assumption of what they see. There's also the assumption that the clients want to get better. And they're not doing this to stay stuck. They're not undermining everything because they don't want to get better. They do want to get better. And it's just a very complex kind of inner world. They do maintain that clients need to be motivated. And that's part of the therapist's job is to motivate the client to make the necessary changes. They um, believe that life is unbearable as it's currently lived with someone who has been diagnosed with borderline personality. They really believe that clients need to learn new behaviors, new coping skills, 
Um, and they also believe that clients cannot fail in counseling. Um, you know, they're going to come, they're going to try. Sometimes, you know, they're going to be able to handle new situations well, and sometimes they're not, but it's, it's all part of the process. And so there's this very um, po positive, hopeful view of treating persons diagnosed with borderline, which is... I think it's important to flag this as this is not the standard, you know, which, you know, talk you're going to hear, you know, in the halls at a counseling agency or even in supervision about working with um, borderline personality disorder. Because historically, um, there hasn't been a lot of success in working with this population. And so there are a lot of, I'll call them just myths or um, ways of, you know, handling this population that, um, do, does not embody these more hopeful assumptions. So in terms of case conceptualization, one of the things you're looking at is the client's patterns for emotional dysregulation, which characterize the, um, the disorder. So you'll see high emotional vulnerability combined um, with an inability to modulate emotion. And so you're looking at for those patterns. You're also assessing for suicidal and self-harming behaviors and so this is an area you would typically assess in a fair amount of detail. You would also assess for therapy interfering behavior. So if they've been in therapy before, why did it terminate? Why didn't it work? And as those arise um, in treatment with this therapist, you know, frequently canceling, um, you know, or not showing up or, you know, always, you know, having tons of crisis, never able to focus, whatever it might be. Look at quality of life interfering behaviors, so things that are creating um, significant problems in terms of substance abuse, um, not being able to, not showing up to work, uh, you know, severing friendships, um, having uh, um, unprotected, you know, in sex with random strangers. These are all life, uh, quality of life interfering behaviors. Spending too much money those sorts of things. So they would look at all those elements that are creating a lot of crisis in the person's day-to-day um, -day life and quality of life. Um, they'll also assess for invalidating environments. And so the therapist will uh, talk with the client about the various environments, which may be work, school, home life, in terms of and identifying environments that have been particularly um, not validating for the client in terms of her emotion and her realities and identifying those. And then finally, uh, getting a detailed trauma history as well as a history of sexism. Over 90, you know, a vast majority of people diagnosed with this um, have trauma histories as well as are women. And so uh, the therapist gets detailed uh, history not only of trauma, but more subtle traumas such, such as um, sexism and or heterosexism, whatever um, might be relevant um, to the client. And certainly being marginalized due to race or ethnicity would be another form of trauma um, that would be assessed as part of this. So targeting, change, and goal setting in DBT, which is, again, as a manualized, evidence-based treatment, it's fairly structured and consistent across clients. So the overarching goal of DBT is to increase dialectical behavior patterns. So the ability to handle um, conflicting and um, emotions and uh, conflicting emotions in relationships and to enable to engage those kind of more complex dialectics that really characterize much of the human condition. To get more specific, um, there's actually a hierarchy of behavioral targets or goals. Behavioral targets a very behavioral um, terminology coming out of almost, um, uh, what was I going to say, almost like a lab technology here, but here it is. So the first is uh, to decrease suicidal behaviors, um, to decrease therapy interfering behaviors, to decrease behaviors that reduce the quality of life, and then to start increasing um, behavioral coping skills. And they are very well defined and printed out on handouts and taught in the group, as well as reinforced in the individual sessions. And these include core mindfulness skills, um, distress tolerance skills, emotional regulation skills, and interpersonal effectiveness skills. And then um, in stage two, 
you would be decreasing behaviors related to trauma. And then finally in stage three, you're increasing self-respect. So these are the basic goals of DBT. They also have secondary goals, um, and these are closely related uh, to the basic skills that they are using, the coping skills. So increasing emotional modulation while decreasing reactivity, increasing self-validation rather than and, uh, while decreasing self-invalidation, increasing realistic decision making while decreasing crisis um, behaviors, increasing emotional experiencing while decreasing inhibited grieving. Increasing uh, active problem solving while decreasing passivity. And then increasing accurate communication of moods and competencies while decreasing mood dependency of behavior. So again, these are closely related to a lot of the, the specific skills that are taught um, in DBT. So now we're going to talk about interventions in DBT. And I want to start by saying there are a lot of them, far more than I can cover in a great depth. Um, in this online lecture, but certainly these are well published. Uh, the instructions for um, the uh, clinicians as well as handouts for the clients are all readily available in publications um, in the book and the manual published by Marsha Linehan on DBT. So um, I will kind of give an overview of these, but certainly they're, they're, all, they're all, you know, well outlined in lots of detail in publications that are readily available. So um, one of the first interventions is that of validation of the therapist validating, validating, communicating to the client that his or her emotions make sense given the context, given her history, it, th there is an emotional logic that is honored and respected. You know, may not necessarily justify, um, you know, crisis behavior, but the validating the emotions and behavioral as well as cognitive. And so there's this validation of the client's reality. And if you remember, one of the things in the case conceptualization was invalidating environments. So typically, um, persons who are diagnosed with this personality disorder um, have come from very invalidating environments. And so part of what the therapist is doing is helping to validate the client so they don't need to have so much drama to communicate um, with others. There are also cheerleading strategies where there's encouragement, even with the smallest uh, attempts, you know, to uh, at change. Are the, there's a lot of encouragement uh, when when clients, you know, take the first small step in a in a good direction, in a new direction. They also uh, talk a lot about, and the so the core skills are mindfulness and talk about wise mind, and so this mindfulness and wise mind talks about uses the basic principles of mindfulness out of um, the, the Buddhist traditions in terms of being mindful of what's going on. So observing, describing, participating in the present moment, identifying right now I'm feeling angry, right now I'm feeling sad, you know, describing it, you know, where do you feel it? How do you experience it? You know, participating in it, you know, allowing yourself to experience it then. Then the how of mindfulness and wise mind is not judging whether it's good or bad, just noticing what's going on, being focused with one mind, and then choosing effectiveness. What's an effective way to, to handle this? Uh, uh, you know, so these are some of the core basic of mindfulness and using wise mind um, skills. Then they also will teach uh, very specific sets of interpersonal effectiveness, so specific skills in terms of communicating with others, communicating your needs effectively, and uh, but in relating with others. There's emotional regulation skills, so what do you do when you start to feel sad or angry or overwhelmed? You know, what are some um, things you can do? And they use, you know, a lot of classic um, CBT adapted with this emphasis on the um, dialectics. Then there's distress tolerance uh, skills. You know, what do you do when your partner disagrees with you? How can you manage that tension? And so learning to have them uh, learn how to manage distress more effectively. And again, um, many of these skills are taught very specifically and concretely through the curriculum in the group. Oh, and yes, the list goes on. Um, another key intervention is what they call behavioral chain analysis strategies. So they teach clients, you know, when there's been a distressing interaction or event, they teach, they teach them to use behavioral analysis skills to look at what were the antecedents, what was going on before, 
you know, what happened behaviorally between, you know, with me and if others were involved, you know, what were the consequences? So they begin to analyze, you know, what's going on, what were the precipitate, you know, precipitating events and how can we prevent some of those? How could, you know, the person have responded differently? So they use, you know, this kind of intense um, behavioral analysis to help clients figure out how to handle difficult situations more effectively. They use insight strategies um, to help clients gain insight uh, as to what's going on for them. Solution analysis strategies, so they help them analyze, you know, solutions in terms of uh, what didn't work, what can work. They look at commitment strategies. How can they um, maintain whatever the commitment has been to, uh, including um, commitment to the therapy process, which is significant in DBT. They have a diary card to help self-monitor. They have contingency uh, management procedures. Um, they have um, procedures and for observing the limits specifically related to treatment and also using family interventions. So there is a wide range of um, interventions that are used both in the group and in the uh, individual therapy sessions to help clients learn how to manage uh, effectively their uh, very intense emotions and to be more effective in their interpersonal relationships. So now I uh, want to uh, move on to talking about research in the evidence space. And so um, DBT is listed and is widely recognized um, as probably the premier evidence-based treatment for DBT, although there are a handful of others. There have been meta-analyses on how it works in terms of um, working with suicidal and self-harming behavior, as well as depression, anxiety, and substance abuse, and eating disorders. So it's been used with various uh, populations, um, often with clients who have multiple problems going on um, in terms of uh, mental health and relationally, and it has been uh, shown to be effective in working with a very difficult to treat population. And finally, I want to wrap up by talking about using DBT with diverse populations. So DBT has been used with um, various cultural groups and they found that it is uh, that they can use the basic manualized uh, procedure with many uh, with persons from very different cultural backgrounds because it ha focuses on the client values rather than having specific values embedded in the approach. And again, this working with the dialectic tensions allows clients to have some choice in terms of how much valuing of the self versus commitment to others and learning how to balance those. And the, the um, framing it all through dialectics allows for a lot more flexibility um, and I would argue even more than traditional DBT, this, this dialectus is looking at individualistic versus relational, you know, commitments and how do we balance those two, um, two things. So there certainly is a possibility to honor um, within that dialectic framework a variety of uh, culturally based values. In terms of sexual diversity, very little has been written on using with LGBTQ, um, but there is one um, article that talks about using DBT to help um, men successfully um, come out. So um, it could, you know, there's no, uh, what do you call, there's no reason to believe it couldn't be successful, but there has not been a ton of work done in this area. So I hope this has been a useful introduction to DBT, and I encourage you again to read further um, either in my textbook or in the original works of Linehan. And again, there's quite a bit of research literature out there on uh, DBT. But if you, it's a really wonderful approach in working with um, clients either diagnosed with borderline personality or who have very complex kind of trauma presentations. I think you'll find there's a lot of a wealth of knowledge here and a very well thought out and well researched approach for working with a very, very difficult to treat population.